Good morning. I'm Janice DeQuilla Pardo. I'm the other co organizer of B Sides, and um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first talk. Uh, before I do, let me uh, remind everyone that we have turned off chat so as not to distract the speakers. Uh, the way that you can interact with them with your questions is to use the Q&A feature that you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So uh, that's where you can leave questions for them and then they can answer you uh, during the talk if they want or at near the end. So um, I'm going to get Ashwini started where our first talk is hacking into the pyramid of resistance against security initiatives. This talk is by Ashwini Siddhi and I would like to welcome you, Ashwini. Hey, thank you so much. Hi, all of you. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can see it. I can see it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. That's great. Uh, so hi, all of you. So uh, this is uh, uh, not a technical talk as such. This is more of how we can work with security as a strategy, right? So it's interesting. It's based on my um, experiences. Uh, so let's talk about it. And even uh, before I really want to talk about these security initiatives, I really want to talk a little bit about myself, right? So I'm Ashwini Siddhi, and first and foremost, I'm really excited to be here. It's my first time at uh, B-Sides Austin. And what do I do? Right, I do all things uh, threat modeling, primarily threat modeling, right, uh, for uh, the data protection suite of products from Dell Technologies. Uh, but uh, like a lot of you, I do get distracted and uh, I get involved in other areas of security like ransomware, supply chain and privacy. Right, I'm sure all of you relate to it. If you've been in the industry for long, I think we have all of our uh, fingers in different pies. So if, if you're somebody like me who's been in the industry for long and who can relate to this, I'm sure this talk um, uh, uh, is also relatable in the sense that right, we Let's say we've been involved in some work for a really long time. Let's say threat modeling. Threat modeling because um, that comes naturally to me and I'm so constantly involved in it. Uh, example, so I, I work with different products and I've been asking them the same repetitive questions, right? Like uh, I know they use tools, uh, tools generate results, et cetera, but to do a holistic threat model, I always ask them uh, questions above and beyond what the tool has to offer, right? Example, like, uh, is your design logical? Is it simplistic enough and still achieving the objectives, uh, business objectives, questions like that, right? And I realized like I was wasting a lot of time asking these questions to each and every product, each and every release. Obviously, there had to be a better way of doing it. It could be like in form of a spreadsheet. Uh, obviously, it came uh, with its own uh, pros. Or it could be building a questionnaire, a web-based questionnaire where everybody can log in and pre-answer so that I don't really have to go back to them and ask. So this is just one example of a security initiative where we're uh, talking about improving a process uh, because we've been there for such a long time and trying to make it better. Right, but it's it it could be a small thing or it could be something as elaborate as starting off a, a complete supply chain security program. It could be anything in between too. It it applies to all of these areas of the spectrum, right? So, so that is what a security initiative uh, would be called as, and I'm sure a lot of us identify with it. See. It's like, yes, I have an idea. And sure, this has to be taken to the table. We, our leaders need to be hearing about this. So we put this in a paper and or a PPT and we make it look fancy. Uh, we set up a call with um, all the important stakeholders. We get all of them on a call. We're really excited. Uh, we go uh, onto the call and blah, blah, blah. This is the best idea ever. This is why we need it. And you go on, right? And people listen to you patiently, yes. Uh, and, and if it's a great organization like mine, I mean, I've set up calls with my boss like N number of times with N number of ideas and he patiently listens to me all the time right so if, if it's a, if it's a leader like that I'm sure you're going to get a lot of time uh, to go put out your ideas 
right? But what happens after you put out your idea, right? Most times, nothing really happens. People say, yes, it's a, you know, you've done a great job. You've actually thought about something which they didn't think about. So it's great, all of that. You get the kudos and good job, but nothing really happens after that. There is no follow-up. There is no action item. There's nothing coming out of it, right? So, uh, so if you're used to this, most probably you'll just get back to work and continue doing what you were doing like every day. No change, right? You're not improving any process. Nothing's being done. Things just carry on as is. But if, if you're the overthinking type, then, you know, more often than not, you're going to judge yourself. And if, if it becomes a repetitive process that none of your ideas are accepted, you also might begin to second guess yourself, right? You might wonder if you're in the right place and, and, and you know, and, and then things go downhill from there. So uh, we don't even want to go there, right? So I think with this talk, you will have a fair idea about what we can do to know how we can get there, right? How we can get our security initiatives out there uh, and make it happen, right? Not, not like right away with a bank, but maybe eventually we'll know how to get there and make it happen. So to make it happen, what is that we need to understand, right? Uh, we, we just go back and think, oh, okay, I presented my idea to uh, the leaders, but the leaders said no. Right, I don't understand why they said no. that. That is a typical uh, response when a security initiative does not get accepted. That's not always the case because resistance to an idea comes in three different levels. Right, I mean, at least in uh, business strategies and business schools, there's something that is defined as a pyramid of resistance. So this pyramid of resistance is not necessarily applicable only to security initiatives. It can be applicable to anything, right? In development, in business, and in a country where a government rolls out new policies, et cetera. So it can be applicable for any given scenario. Anything new that is introduced as a policy, tool, a rule is always gonna be met with some amount of resistance. But for all practical purposes in this talk, uh, I think let's limit this to security initiatives. So the pyramid as such talks about three different levels of the lower level would be not knowing, and then we have the not able, and then at the top would be not willing. Uh, obviously, you can come back to me and say that, uh, you know, it, it's uh, interchangeable. I don't agree with the order, all of that. Uh, but this is the standard definition of pyramid of resistance, which is defined for business strategies. All right. So in our case, what would not knowing be? Right, not knowing would be that somebody does not know why is that we want to initiate something new. How, what is the value that it is going to bring to them, right? So that that is not knowing. And not able would be that maybe somebody is at a level where they can actually understand things, uh, but they certainly don't have the capability or, or bandwidth, et cetera. And leadership, um, I, I just wouldn't say leadership, but at least at the top level is not willing uh, because they have other priorities, et cetera. At an individual level, right, most people are focused on what they have to do, their deliverables. Sadly, security uh, domain has a lot of, uh, we've always heard of resource crunch and all of these issues, right? People are generally overworked. It's, it's something that's uh, been talked about and people tend to focus on what is their goal. Uh, for the year and try to stick to that. It's very few people tend to step out of their comfort zone to achieve something. So that is a barrier at an individual level. That might be the reason a lot of people uh, would say no to anything new that is being introduced. And also there's a psychological barrier, right? So example, so um, when I come to you and say that I found this really cool tool, um, it automates everything. It uses uses AI, uh, machine learning. So you don't really have to do anything manual. For, let's say threat modeling again, right? You don't have to do anything manual for every release, right? You can just put feed in your design for one release. And from there, it uses AI and ML and continuously uh, takes care of things for you. W would people be excited? Uh, despite uh, all the promises that it is making, not always, right? Maybe there are some people who are willing to experiment, but most of them would have a psychological barrier against something new, right? It, it's a natural human phenomenon. And this is one of the things that adds to the pyramid of resistance. So that is at an individual level. But what happens at 
the program level, right? This is where our uh, mid-level leadership comes into the picture. Uh, the program has other priorities. Let's say you come up with an idea in the middle of the year. For the given year, we already have our goals very well defined. I mean, if you're an organization that works uh, with ODSMs and your goals and strategy very well defined, right? You already have things that you need to achieve for the year. You're certainly not going to move things around to right away introduce your security initiative. But yes, I mean, if it's if, if things work out, it can be added to the backlog to pick up the next year. So there's always other priorities and things um, might not happen when you want them to happen, right? And also there's a bit of comfort zone. Example, people use open source threat modeling tool. They download this tool and use it. They're comfortable with it because they've been using this for like 10, 15 years now, and they just don't want to move out of the comfort zone, right? This comfort zone is giving them results. Yes, it has some manual effort involved, but they're okay with it because they've been used to it, right? So that comfort zone is there. People are not willing to move out of the comfort zone. And also the leadership, uh, when I say leadership, the mid-level leadership wouldn't like to change the winning formula. And it's not just about le uh, mid-level leadership. It could be anything, right? We have the FIFA World Cup going on. Uh, India is so much into cricket. So any of the teams uh, that have a winning formula, right? The winning team members, we tend to stick to it. We don't want to experiment, especially when we are winning, especially when it is working for us. So that is the comfort zone uh, that we all try to align to and we want to play it safe. Uh, while it's good to play safe, this comfort zone might also create barriers for new uh, innovative ideas. So that is the uh, program level resistance that you would encounter. And at the leadership budgets, right? I really wanted to call out budgets, especially in these times, uh, right? So now you're using an open source tool, again, for threat modeling. And let's say you go, go to the leadership and say, I found this amazing tool uh, that follows infrastructure as a code, uh, just pulls out models from your existing code and gives me results. Sounds amazing but you will have to pay uh, the cost of the license, right? For every product, there's a license associated. Uh, would you be willing to spend it at this point in time in this current economic situation? No, right? So the timing matters, the budgeting matters, how well uh, the cost of this uh, initiative fits into the current organizational expenditure. What is that they uh, intend to spend for the year? Does it fit into it? So. The budget is a major barrier, and based on my experience, I can say it is the biggest barrier I've seen so far, right? So we'll have to be considerate about the budgets to when and how we want to approach it, uh, et cetera. So I'll talk about now what we can do to work around the budget um, in the next slide. And a lot of times we have a culture inertia. Uh, but this is a very soft uh, power uh, barrier that we have, it is not right away visible. It's not something that anybody would call out, right? For example, uh, let's say uh, there's an organization that does threat modeling very quickly, right? So they use an open source tool and they draw a diagram, generate their results and say, yes, we've done with threat modeling. Whereas there's another organization that believes that, okay, I don't believe a tool can actually look into my design because my design is very specific. And I don't think a tool can do that. So I would like to get onto a whiteboard, collaborate with my people, spend about three to four hours looking at the design, and then understand the design level threats. And that would be my threat model. Right? So th there are two different thought streams. Uh, organization one is focused on the time, whereas organization two is focused on the depth of it. So there's a culture inertia already associated with it. If you went to organization one and said, uh, I don't like the way you do threat modeling, it's too quick, you might want to change something, the immediate response would be no, that's not happening, right? Uh, it affects uh, time to market and uh, time to release. All of these um, fair enough reasons would be heard. Right, so culture inertia is something that we'll uh, have to keep in mind, though it's not very obvious. One of the other examples uh, that I can think for culture inertia are very relevant, right? Uh, it's also about the type of organization that we work with. 
there are organizations with um, extremely restrictive work culture, like, you know, uh, you're tracked every minute of the day. What is that you do every little hour that you spend on? Uh, when do you log in? When do you lo log out? But there are other organizations that are very flexible, right? And, and when they say flexible, they don't even define working hours, right? You can log in whatever works for you, whatever time works for you. Obviously, you need to spend that minimum uh, time of hours. But in, in, in such an organization, which is so extra flexible, right, you go and suddenly tell them that, you know, I don't think I would like uh, to allow these people to get in their own devices into the organization. It would be met with a lot of resistance because it just does not go well with the culture of the organization, right? So it's really important to keep in mind how our initiative aligns with the uh, culture of the organization itself. So this is what the pyramid of resistance looks like. And more often than not, a combination of all of these actually uh, uh, stops the progress of our initiative. But not to worry, uh, there's a pyramid of resistance. There's also a pyramid of influence around it, right? So there's always something that we can do about it. A lot of us have worked around it. Um, you must be wondering, right? So, okay, uh, I presented an idea, but it didn't work. Uh, my boss said no, but uh, my co-worker presented an idea and it was immediately accepted, right? You must be wondering, how did this person do it? Uh, how did it even happen? Uh, it, it, it's not partiality, right? I and mean, that does not happen in business. So what does that work for your co-worker? What has that happened with the other idea? Probably knowingly or unknowingly, this co-worker or the one you know, who presented this idea that got accepted worked through this pyramid of influence. So what does the pyramid of influence look like? Right. So it starts at the top of the organization with the leadership. So what do you do here? Right. We spoke about culture inertia. Right. So your idea did not fit into what the organization believes in, what the mission of the organization was, et cetera. So it's important for you to ensure that the idea that you're proposing is in alignment with the organization. Example, again, right? Your organization is all about cloud now, providing services, et cetera, over the cloud, which also mean things are more agile and maybe you have releases every week or every two weeks. And during such a time, you go and say that I have this amazing idea of doing threat modeling, not just for security, but for privacy, but for compliance all together in one. So that we shift um, it left completely at the design level and save a lot of manners at the later time and probably have a tool around it too, right? It's an amazing idea. Yes, we should all be doing that, but does it work really well in the context of the organization? Uh, doing all of this, now, if not planned correctly, would easily take a week's time. And you have a release timeline of two weeks, right? Is it really aligning with your organizational goals? No, that's not going to happen, right? So uh, you need to have that vision uh, to understand what is the strategy of the organization? What is that we're trying to do, right? What is the overall goal of the organization? And ensure that any given initiative always ties back to the bigger vision of the organization. And that is the first step um, that we will always uh, need to align with, right? And what after we've done that? Uh, the leadership most times understands numbers only, right? It's all about KPIs and metrics and costs. And we also spoke about budgeting. So what do we do in such a case? Maybe you don't really know, you know, uh, security is not... Uh, your, your leadership might come back and say security is not revenue generating. So what am I to do here, right? You just don't drop your idea. So what do you do? You understand the cost that you can save from the breaches that happen if you're not doing this. Or you can highlight the time that you're saving with all of these um, activities by introducing this initiative and call out how the time to market has improved, right? Or you can also call out uh, how this ties back to compliance or legal and what is the cost you can say in terms of um, litigations or uh, reputation, etc. Right. So showcasing in such numbers 
or a combination of these numbers. Uh, I, I wouldn't say put an exact number out there, but um, some sort of a projection out there. I think it'll speak well to the board and you'll have uh, good uh, reception, right? So it's important to align your vision as well as call out these benefits of your in initiative, right? Uh, you cannot just tie back your initiative to your very specific problem that you're talking about. It has to tie back to uh, a budgetary scenario, uh, uh, either about money, either about saving uh, your reputation or about time to market, etc. So once you've done all that, you know, done your homework, put in a PPT, uh, aligned and presented to everybody, what do you do next, right? You get a sponsor. And, and, and when I say a sponsor, I don't mean monetarily a sponsor. Yes, your organization has to monetarily sponsor your initiative. It's not necessarily that um, when I say monetary, it means only a tool. It can also mean that you need uh, resources in terms of, let's say, developers, contractors, et cetera. Uh, uh, so you might need to spend on them or you know, even time, et cetera, right? So that is a different kind of sponsorship. But when I say get a sponsor, what I mean is that get a sponsor who can support your idea. See, it's important to remember that in the corporate world, unless it is popular to support you, nobody is going to support you, right? So you have to find that uh, somebody who's popular, who can support you, only then your ideas will gather steam and then get spoken about a lot more and then get percolated uh, much down the pyramid. So get a sponsor who believes in your idea as much as you do. Um, and, and it's not easy, right? It's not as easy. I would say uh, alignment with the vision is much more easier than getting a sponsor. Uh, because getting a sponsor requires courage, right? You need to believe in your idea. You need to have trust in your idea and you need to know that you are the SME in this area and this idea can really work. And there are times a lot of people will not see or have the vision that you have. They're not able to see as far as you can. So you need to be confident about it and get a sponsor and get the sponsor to believe in your idea too. And once you have done that, I don't see any reason why your idea would not be accepted, right? So you have your idea accepted and then you get down to uh, the senior mid-level management, right? So what do you do here? Here, it's important to initiate and drive actions. Yes, you've... Um, got the go ahead for your initiative but you just can't go ahead right away and you know uh, and start things rolling out things immediately right you will need to create a poc a small bit and see if it works um, and then probably do things in a phased approach but even before that right the when you initiate and drive actions it's important to know that an idea completely depends on people uh, you might come back and tell me that, no, I'm a technical SME, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a securities pro. I'm an expert in this area. I don't need to be managing relationships. Uh, but sorry to say a wake up call. Any job after a while is about managing your stakeholders. It's about managing people. It's not that just a manager manages people, but all of us at a, after a given point of time need to manage our stakeholders and need to manage relationships. And the best way to do this is to create a core team, right? So let's say you're building this tool as a security engineer for whatever reason, right? Doing threat modeling, or maybe you're automating your testing, um, et cetera. You build a core team. And what do you do with this core team? So this core team should have representation from all of the important stakeholders. Uh, when I say important stakeholders, it could mean your managers, uh, it could be end users, it could be end users from different um, sub organizations within the organization, et cetera, right? So get all of these people together, create a core team, have regular cadence, talk about uh, action items, et cetera. And most importantly, assign um, activities to each of these people, right? It's important uh, that there is some sense of ownership in each of these people. Uh, it, it, it's a small trick when you give uh, get people to own things, uh, they actually go about doing it. So they have invested in the effort um, and they own that bit of it. So they're always going to be vocal about this idea and they're always going to talk pro about it. 
uh, it, it, it's a strategy that a lot of governments use it to, right? Sometimes um, uh, recently, uh, our government rolled out a policy where every person had to contribute something, and every person who contributed to this policy had only good things to say about it. It was the people who didn't contribute to this policy uh, had doubts about it. So the minute you get somebody involved, the minute they are invested in it, they are going to most probably right uh, be towards or be for the idea so it's good to have people that always talk about how good the idea is etc so they get things going uh, you get to do your poc all of that uh, but it's always important to have one devil's advocate on the team right um, i always do that i always have one devil's advocate on the team so these are the people that are completely against the idea right and 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 they ask you questions like you would be like okay why did i even come up with this idea why did i even take up this job right so they make you think a lot but it's important uh, to listen to them because they might give you the most critical feedback and the devil is in the details, right? So this is what will make your initiative much more finer. This is what will make your initiative much more uh, applicable across all spectrum of users, users whom you hadn't thought of, finer details that you hadn't thought of, right? So it's important to have this devil's advocate, but also keep in mind, right? This person can... Um, stop progress completely because you're so focused on doing the finer things of your initiative you might completely miss out on the bigger picture so it's about uh, achieving the balance uh, keep in mind that um, perfection is the enemy of good so don't try to achieve perfection for your security initiative right away get a poc going uh, get feedback and prioritize it and then start applying it uh, to your initiative and then divide the rest of these into different phases the first one has to obviously be the mvp the minimum viable product uh, which is just sellable right the basic structure and the core of it is ready and after which you apply uh, the p1 or the p2 uh, related activities around it so that is how you would put the roadmap to initiate and drive actions and one other important thing you will have to keep in mind is that you have a core team and core team can always there can be scenarios where they're not always uh, agreeing to single point right uh, person a might say i like this idea person b might say i don't like this idea but it is up to you to show ownership uh, and take a call yes i will decide on what uh, goes in this so it, it, it's not about um, one man show here but it's also about taking ownership right uh, ultimately the buck stops at you you are responsible for it so taking that ownership uh, is really important we all like to be democratic we want to be we want everyone to be heard, especially in a core team, because we feel like they're part of a team, all of that. But as long as you don't stand up and take ownership, things might just go here and there, and you might have n different ideas to work with. So that is with uh, uh, initiating and driving actions. And once you've done that, and you have a basic structure ready for your idea, it's important to go back to your end users, right? So where you effectively communicate with them what is that you're trying to do with this initiative right because they have no idea because they're so focused on what they are expected to do and they're completely uh, overworked and they have a psychological barrier remember so it's important to drive effective communication if you have a communication team work with them draft communications appropriately review them multiple times and then send out this and also create trainings for people right don't expect that you get onto a call give them a demo and they're going to be awesome at it the next day you might find it easy because you've been thinking about it day and night but it's not the same for that uh, the other people too right people have different uh, uh, degrees of how they can scale up to something new so it's always good to have a training created and um, shared uh, with these people and once you've done that, right, it's always important to connect the dots back to your leadership at the higher level. Go back and show them the results. If you are not showing the results, 
the right things might not progress. Your initiative is a continuous improvement. It's not that you start right away and stop immediately. Uh, things don't work like that, right? You have divided it into phases, right? So how do you get the funding? How do you get uh, the support for it in a constant manner over a multi-year tenure? You tie back your uh, actions, uh, as results and you show it to your leadership to say that, okay, this is what you've achieved and this is what you've been doing. Showing results and closing the loop becomes really important in your pyramid of influence. And two things that I've not really called out here is that uh, the power of storytelling, right? That is really important across all of these uh, stages in the pyramid. When you're highlighting a problem uh, to your leadership, the problem has to indicate the pain that is present. If there is no pain that you're solving, if there's no problem that you're solving, your initiative does not really matter, right? You will have to highlight the pain uh, that is caused and um, clearly call out a problem statement and the objective for your initiative. That is important. And the second tip would be that the power of deliverables, right? It's important to go back and tie as KPIs and metrics. Um, so always try to KPI and metrify your uh, initiative. So that gives you an added advantage over uh, any other initiative. And last but not the least, at the individual level, right, where people are like, oh no, another initiative, I think you should try to reinforce beliefs and experiences. And how do you do that? But you go to talk about your initiative as training or as a demo. Don't always make it about a technical talk, right? I know we are uh, security SMEs, so we tend to talk a lot of technical stuff, but always have a backstory associated with it, right? The messaging has to be emotional. It has to connect at that um, point, right? You'll have to talk about what was the problem that you faced and why you worked around this and how you came about it. You might be inspiring somebody else uh, to work around this pyramid of influence too when you talk about your backstory. And that's how organizations grow. And that's how organizations do great things and innovate stuff. Uh, so always ensure that you add your personal backstory uh, when you're reinforcing beliefs. And that gives an additional edge to your initiative, to your persona, and to your reputation at the organization. And that's how you would make uh, changes happen in your organization. So that's all I had uh, about how you need to work around um, your security initiative. Uh, any questions, um, I'll take it or I'll wait around the Discord channel too. Thank you, Ashwini. Thank you very much for your experience that you just shared with us. I um, Unfortunately, we're out of time for live questions, um, but uh, we have a channel set up in Discord just for this talk mm -hmm. and Ashwini has agreed to head over there next. So um, if you have a question for her, you, if you'd like to discuss this talk with her, please head over there. Um, there was a question in the live Q&A that someone left, so please head over there to ask it. And um, we need to get started on the next talk. I'm so sorry, but thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to um, transition. Give us a moment, please. <laughs>